Hello and welcome to the Dissect and Connect podcast. I'm your host, Mike Wade. This is the podcast where we explore population health issues impacting your community. The Dissect and Connect podcast is a service of Montgomery County Prevention Partners and New River Valley Community Services. Beth Macy is the author of three New York Times bestselling books. Her latest book, Dope Sick, Dealers, Doctors, and the Drug Company that Addicted America, was shortlisted for the Carnegie Medal, won the LA Times Book Prize for Science and Technology, and was described as a masterwork of narrative nonfiction by the New York Times. Her first book, Factory Man, won a J. Anthony Lucas Prize, and her second book, True Vine, was a Kirkus Prize finalist. She is also the creator of the Audible Original audio documentary, Dope Sick, Finding Tess. So I have to say it's an absolute thrill to have Beth Macy as our guest on the Dissect and Connect podcast. So, Beth, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. First of all, congratulations on the uh, massive success and well-deserved notoriety of uh, your book, Dope Sick. Uh, I'm sure the last two years have been a bit of a whirlwind. You, uh, as I know from just following you, have seen that you've spoken all over the country. You've done tons of book signings. Um, it's been a busy time for you. What's what's that been like? Uh, kind of like being thirsty and somebody puts a fire hose. There's <laughs> 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 a fire hose at your mouth. It's like everything you want, but it's a lot. Um, but it's gotten easier. I mean, I'm not traveling at all right now. Like uh, Last trip was early March, you know, when the pandemic hit. And my suitcases are just sitting over in the corner and they don't know what to do. But it's kind of awesome to be home. Yeah, I'm sure. Hey, for those who are uh, unfamiliar uh, with the book or have not had an opportunity yet to read it, could you give us a bit of a synopsis of the book and what it's about? Sure. Um, Dope Sick uh, tells the story of the opioid crisis as I witnessed it landing over the past two decades. So I tried to hone in deep on three Virginia communities that I thought could stand in as a representative for the arc of the epidemic. So it began with the introduction of OxyContin, which was targeted in high Medicaid disability areas where the jobs were going away, like the coal fields of Virginia. So I started out talking about Lee County and because they were really the first to experience um, just high levels of drug-related crime and OxyContin overdose deaths. And they also fought back from the very beginning. So that was a story, too, about people ha- having agency or trying really hard to have agency in their own story. And then I picked up the story uh, in Roanoke, where I've been a reporter for three decades, around mm-hmm. 2012. I did a, uh, I was a new, longtime newspaper reporter. I did a three-part series on heroin landing in our suburbs and didn't really understand the connection between OxyContin and heroin at the time until I went back and did the book. But when I did this piece about like a nascent heroin cell in the wealthy suburbs of Hidden Valley, Southwest Roanoke County, which is the picture on the cover of the book, readers kind of like spit their coffee up and went, what? Wealthy white people do heroin? We we had no idea. And of course the goal was to, to tell people that this was here and that a lot of the kids had gotten their start stealing opioid pills in their medicine cabinets and i remember my editor carol tarrant saying you know if you if we could just get uh families in the region grandparents and parents to get rid of all those excess opioid pills in their cabinets we we you know be doing our jobs so it was really just to put people on alert and then the third storyline takes place up in the northern shenandoah valley uh around a little area called woodstock and So a sort of a farming community, not particularly distressed, but where a twice convicted heroin dealer uh, arrived in 2015 and set about turning it into one of the largest heroin rings in the state from this unlikely cute little antique store filled town. And of course, that was a way to talk about the war on drugs and mass incarceration and how we don't really do anything for people when they come out of prison and many go back to the only way that they operate for, to eat, which is selling drugs when we don't provide them alternatives. So um, 
those are, and you could have written this book anyway. That was the way I happened upon it. I tried to just kind of dissect as much meaning as I could out of each kind of community that I wrote about. Do you think there's been um, a level of denial in communities like Southwest Virginia and Central Virginia where we, we haven't really seen this as a problem in our backyard, that we think it's more of a metropolitan big city issue? Well, I mean, I think some people, I'm sure people in your peer group know about it. Mm -hmm. um, everybody knows, I mean, at this point, everybody knows somebody who's suffered with this. And I posit that, like, unlike most drug epidemics that start in the cities and then eventually make their way to rural areas, this, this drug epidemic begins in distressed rural areas and in distressed cities, too, but it makes itself known first in these distressed tiny communities like Lee County, Virginia, because there was all of a sudden crime on a level that they had never seen before. Right. Uh, you know, I remember a sheriff saying, yeah, we had... We arrested a guy for trading his family mule for four Oxycontin pills. Farmers, miners, loggers, people who'd never missed a day of work, losing everything they had because of this drug. And what you had when you peeled back the layers was a, a pharmaceutical company, followed by others, but really Purdue started it, unleashing this notion that we had known for 100 years that uh, Oxycontin, Opioids were addictive and should only be used for end of life and cancer. And uh, all of a sudden, unleashing this new drug with the message that opioids are safe for moderate pain and chronic conditions. And so then you had kids getting prescribed it for 30 days for wisdom teeth surgery or sprained thumb after a softball game, stuff like that. And so I think. I think the denial come, it comes when people get really deep into their addiction and they um, harm members of their family. Um, people are scared of them. Sometimes they've stolen from them, have had outbreaks, have created a lot of pain in their own families. And then when people get sort of disowned by their families or seen as the other, you know, that's when things really, really fall apart as the story I tell near the end of the book demonstrates i think yeah just a real argument for why we need you know a social safety network mm -hmm. obviously when you take the time to write a book you hope that it finds an audience but did you anticipate that it would be as well received as it has been no i never do i mean i've written all three of my books have luckily on my little table here been bestsellers but the first two moderately so and this one um has really by far sold them more than the first two combined. Um, I just think it, the, the topic touches a lot of people. A lot of people know someone. I tried to write it in such a way that it wasn't just doom and gloom, although there is a lot of doom and gloom, but I tried to write it in a narrative way that would hold a reader's interest maybe if they didn't know somebody. I mean, that's what I always try to do. I try to help readers un understand complex things like globalization or racism or whatever by going deep into a few people's stories um, and make you care about the characters. So with Dope Sick, the goal is really to bring alive people who are addicted, their families, um, but also the people who are fighting back, like Dr. Van Z and Sister Beth, who fought mm -hmm. back from the coal fields, an ATF agent up in the Shenandoah, Valley, who, you know, put this drug dealer away, um, you know, mothers here in Roanoke who were trying to divert people who were addicted and were being arrested for addiction-related crime and to get them into treatment and kind of shouting to the rooftops that, look, it, it's not only better for them as human beings if we treat them as people with a medical issue who deserve care, but it's also better for society because... It's cost savings, you know, for every dollar we spend on treatment, we save, I think, $12 mm -hmm. from incarceration. And, um, gosh, I used to know that number off the top of my head. <laughs> I'm a little rusty in COVID. But um, it makes it any way you count it to give people to not just treat them as criminals or moral failures. Well, hindsight is twenty twenty, and you um, spend a lot of time uh, addressing this issue and, and digging into it. So um, let me just pose this question to you. 
What, if anything, could we have done differently in the early stages of this whole thing to prevent it from becoming the epidemic that it did and still is? Yeah, so we really let the pharmaceutical company push us around. We let them talk the FDA into approving the drug. We trusted that our federal government wouldn't become bought off by lobbyists and politicians who were bought off by pharmaceutical companies. We trusted them to protect our health, Food and Drug Administration, mm -hmm. approve this drug, allow the company to say it was believed to, because of its new time release mechanism, it was believed to reduce the liability of addiction and abuse. And right away, we knew that wasn't true. Dr. Van Zee starts writing them letters three years into it, calling them on the phone, begging them to take it off the market until it could be reformulated to be resistant to abuse, which they didn't do for 14 years. Um, so the FDA fell down on the job. Congress fell down on the job when it kneecapped the DEA from allowing it to go after uh, suspicious orders among distributors. So that was that Argos data that you saw come out in the Washington Post mm -hmm. in the Charleston paper uh, last year where billions of pills were shipped all over the country. I mean, millions of pills to a tiny town of 400 some people in right. Kermit, West Virginia. Um, doctors bought the lines of pharma reps hook, line, and sinker. Uh, a pharma rep would find out what a doctor liked say they collected Cuban cigars or was a Red Sox fan. Well, some Red Sox tickets might appear in their box or the very nicest cigar, a Christmas ham, like you name it, these pharma reps would uh, deliver it to doctors in exchange for, uh, you know, it wasn't direct quid pro quo, but we know from research that they prescribed the drugs more. And so a lot of heavy-handed tactics, doctor, doctors were busy, they were in the throes of managed care, and, um, and also, by the way, Purdue funded all these trumped-up pain societies to tell doctors that, oh, we have data now mm -hmm. saying that it's safe to, do, to prescribe opioids for all manner of issues and that it's woefully undertreated. And, you know, and you could do it because this guy, like, this guy from Yale or Cornell says it's good. But what they don't say is he's been funded by Purdue to say that. And so they were like, well, Russell Portnoy says that's true. And the American Pain Foundation says that's true. Well, they're both being funded by Purdue. So we've got to stop. Um, the regulators need to start regulating again instead of being regulated by the industry. <laughs> And, um, and we've got to get money out of politics and we've got to start voting with more sense and becoming more active because, um, you know, you want to say this blindsided everybody, but it's been happening now for two decades mm -hmm. and not until it happens in everybody's backyard do we really start paying attention to it. Right. You uh, mentioned earlier that you had interviewed a number of families uh, for Dope Sick and a lot of those were parents who lost children that were literally in the prime of their lives with bright futures. Aside from the obvious heartbreak that comes with that, did you find any commonality among those families that you came to know? Yeah, um, many of them didn't and still don't understand how it was. Their beautiful only child ended up dead on someone else's bathroom floor with a needle in their arm. Uh, mm -hmm. One mother... I mean, the book begins with me meeting a mother at her son's gravesite. Right. And she asked me to explain to her why that happened. And so then I just started peeling the layers of the onion. I end up going to visit this drug dealer in prison at the beginning of the book to try to answer her question with the idea that if I could answer this question for Christy, then I could answer it for the mothers and fathers all over America. You know, let that story stand in. And, of course, we'll let you find out. By the end of the book, when I finally get to sit down with this guy, is you know there are no easy answers, and it's a way more complicated story than putting away one drug dealer. Mm -hmm. uh, way, way, way more complicated. So, um, and that, and it's a much larger story than one person's addiction. It's you can't tell the story without saying the government failed us, the regulators didn't regulate, 
big pharma failed us and the war on drugs has failed us because the only tool we seem to use too often is the tool of incarceration and punishment rather than the understanding that many of these folks were initially addicted uh, through no fault of their own. Mm -hmm. Speaking of families, I literally just this past weekend, as a matter of fact, uh, started reading your first book, Factory Man. And uh, that obviously addresses the impact of globalization on American industry. But I found it interesting that within some of the first few pages um, of that book, you make note of your own father's alcoholism mm -hmm. and describe him as the, quote, serially unemployed town drunk. I wonder if the experience of writing and researching for Dope Sick has caused you to reflect any differently upon your father's own issues with addiction. Yeah, I was actually just, I was hiking Mill Mountain yesterday, and I, I was thinking of that, actually. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you grow up as a parent, as a child of somebody with addiction, there's a lot of resentments. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, why can't you care for me or the way my friends, parents care for them? And um, He did one awesome thing, uh, which is he gave me the world's best grandmother who lived next door. So I had a lot of advantages that uh, I had the advantage of all this incredible attention. She taught me how to read when I was four and spoiled me run. <laughs> um, but, you know, we didn't really have much of a relationship because he was pretty, I was born late to my parents and uh, midlife accident. And uh, we, I, mean, I have very few memories that are positive of my dad, very few, um, which is still makes me really sad but I, I i would say that the experience of learning more about addiction generally has made me feel more sympathy for him because it wasn't any fun being him you know he spent every day at the vfw drinking himself to oblivion and uh, really really hard on my mom mm -hmm. i mentioned in the intro your audio documentary finding tess um, can you tell me a little bit more about that project? Yeah. Um, so it's a six-part podcast um, done as an Audible original. Mm -hmm. So free to members of Audible, or you can purchase it if you're not a member. And it's, a, it's audio only, so it's not a book. But it's basically, it begins where the book ended with the death of, death of Tess Henry, who right. was addicted to heroin and had been sent to Las Vegas for rehab and of course quickly ended up out in the streets where she had been in Roanoke going now she's on the streets of Las Vegas and it ends with her murder on Christmas Eve. Um, another addicted person found her body at the bottom of a dumpster on Christmas Eve of 2017 and I had finished the book when this happened so I went back and rewrote the ending and I just kept um, reporting on it and spending time with her mother and just really felt I owed it to her to really try to find out what happened. And so her mother and I over beers at Mellow Mushroom one night, we always go there because it's in between my house and hers. We order the same thing every time. We uh, decided to go to Las Vegas and try to put pressure on the cops, try to, put, to retrace Tessa's last steps. And I had already promised her I would do that when Audible reached out and asked if I wanted to do an Audible original project. And so I pitched that and they went for it. Um, so then they paired me with a really great um, Audible audio producer named Emily Martinez. Mm -hmm. And she went out the next time that Pat and I went to Las Vegas and we interviewed some of the same people we found the first time. We found new people. Um, and... Um, it's a real window into exactly what happened when somebody gets so low. I mean, you got to remember this girl had been an honor roll student right. from a really nice family in the nicest section of town, vacational. Dad was a surgeon. Mom worked at a hospital. I mean, of all families that you would think could deal with an issue like this, it was them. But in some ways, and I point this out in dosing, wealth isn't protective. Right. When stigma takes over and everybody's ashamed to talk about it mm -hmm. or 
Well, in Tessa's case, there was this thinking that abstinence only was the only way out of it for her, and she just couldn't do it. And most people who are addicted to opioids can't do an abstinence only model. I think it right. works with like 8% versus 60 or more if you use medication assisted treatment and mm -hmm. counseling. So that's that podcast allowed me to go deeper with where Tess fell through the holes, you know, fell through the cracks of treatment. And, you know, she was trying so hard to get back to get better for her son, who she wanted to get custody of and raise. And she was, re we think she was really close to getting on that plane to coming home and somebody took her life. Sadly, it's not uncommon. I know, I know. Aside from the notoriety that we talked about at the beginning of the show, what have you personally gained from this project, this experience? Gosh. Well, it's really just an extension of the reporting I've always done, you know, even as a newspaper reporter at the Run of Times. I'm allowed to, now that I write books, I'm allowed to really delve into things for longer periods of time. Mm -hmm. And that allows me to follow people over a year, two years, whereas the most used to hope for was a couple of months at the paper, which right. is still pretty rare. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I just hope to shine light on really complicated issues to try to tease them apart. You know, in in this era where you have newspapers closing right and left and laying reporters off and I already talked about the lack of regulation, we need people to to hold uh, power accountable. And that's what I hope my work does. And uh, there were scary times when I was working on this, you know, going up against these billion dollar pharmaceutical companies and stuff like that. And from my son's former bedroom in my house in Raleigh Court, <laughs> you know, I just, it, it, it takes persistence. It takes being a self-starter. But it just takes sitting your butt down in a chair every day and doing the work and not being afraid to ask stupid questions and hard questions. And um, so I'm I'm always learning new things. Every every story, every project, I learn something new. And now I'm working on this uh, TV show that's based on Dope Sick, and I'm I'm really a baby at that. I don't know this. Um, I know about that much about screenwriting, but <laughs> every day I learn maybe this much more. And so that's been really interesting. Well, I was going to ask you about uh, about projects that you've got going on right now and some future things that are happening for you. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so Hulu has um, is making uh, an eight-part um, limited series called based on the book Dope Sick, uh, which tells the story of the first third of the book. Mm -hmm. And um, really it's about the federal case to, right. uh, to bring um, the pharma industry to account and what went wrong and how the opioid crisis landed. So that's kind of going back and revisiting in some ways in even greater detail, just that portion of the book. Um, but it's been a kind of a creative challenge for me because I hadn't done that kind of writing before. And so I'm in a room with six other people and the showrunner who is the boss is um, just a great guy mm -hmm. and writer and producer and actor named Danny Strong. And so that's been really fun. And we work on Zoom since COVID. I was out in LA for a bit and then uh -huh. we all just work at home. So I came back here and, um, and then I've got another book I'm starting. I've started I haven't actually started writing it yet. Don't tell my editor that. But I started <laughs> reporting it. It's called The Fix, and it's about solutions to the opioid crisis told through the lens of some communities that have made, that have huge challenges. Some have made great strides. They're all really hard, and I think it'll be instructive in many ways, um, both good and bad. And then um, also through the the lawsuits and the settlements that are ongoing to try mm -hmm. to bring pharma to account. So I'll be following that through the lens of at least one of the lawyers working on that. Well, those are pretty exciting and uh, really look forward to both of those. Thank you so much. I mean, Hulu, so that's a, that's a big deal. Right now? <laughs> what, are you, what are you guys up to? Um, well, you know what? I wanted to talk to you about current events and um, the reports 
at a local and, and national level that um, overdoses are increasing. Skyrocketing, um, I'm told. Yeah, and a lot of that's I being mean, attributed, obviously, to the COVID-19 pandemic. And people being and isolated. People losing their jobs. Yeah. And yesterday I read that 5.4 million Americans have lost their health insurance because yeah. they lost their jobs. Yeah. So what's your that's take? That's not an, art of a universe, an argument for universal health care. I don't know what is. We, uh, we might take that up on a different episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no, I'm just, I've got some notes here because I was on a podcast a couple of weeks ago uh-huh. about this very issue. And I had done some just reaching out to my sources. And, uh-huh. uh, you've got one of the communities I'm following in rural North Carolina, overdoses are up 75% wow. so far this year. In, in Roanoke, uh, overdose deaths have tripled, especially polysubstance. Mm hmm. Uh, including methamphetamine and um, also drugs of unknown origin right. from the dark web right? because the supply lines are being interrupted. Is that what you're seeing? Hearing a lot about the presence of fentanyl yeah, being being mixed in with some of those uh, those other drugs. And is that coming in from China on the dark web mostly? Uh, we're getting closer to uh, more regional sources, um, particularly in Giles County, had some conversations with law enforcement officials over there, and they point to um, Bluefield and Princeton, West Virginia, as being a hot spot of, of where a lot of that seems to be coming from. Of oh, fentanyl, and that's because of 77, yep. 81. Yeah. Right, yeah. So it's it's obviously very troubling. I mean, you know, the, the opioid uh, epidemic hasn't gone away because of COVID-19, and I think it's uh-huh. I, I think it's becoming more of a problem. No, oh, one of my sources calls it a pandemic within a pandemic. It's all these fissures that were already exposed by the opioid crisis is now the same fissures. Mm-hmm. Lack of mental health treatment, lack of health care in general, incarceration over health care. We're seeing all that, um, whether you have addiction or not. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of folks who are in recovery are, are relapsing. So, um some local groups here in Roanoke are really st- trying to reach out to people who are are vulnerable and, and maybe have never experienced um, uh, mental health problems yeah. until now with their social networks gone. So that's really important too. I mean, in Roanoke just a few weeks ago, we lost a, a guy who had a restaurant. He was a swim coach, Louis Tudor, very beloved here. And um, to suicide, suicides are really going through the roof too absolutely it's really important to reach out to your people yeah and we are uh, on our end trying to push narcan as much as we can to get it out in the community Um, and i know there's some i know there's some pushback on that because people feel like you know there are some who are struggling with addiction that that use that as a bit of a crutch and maybe push their limits their boundaries as far as their uh, tolerance goes and use that as a bit of a safety net to catch them if they get to that point but um, as I continue to say to anyone who will listen, we can't get people into treatment if they're dead. That's right. So That's exactly right. I'm told about some communities where the police don't want to carry Narcan because they don't want to get that close to people in case they have COVID. Have you heard about that? I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. Do you think there's any truth to it? I, I don't know. I mean, I still think there's a lot of misconceptions and bad information around things like fentanyl, you know, and the and the the lethality of, of that drug. And, you know, if you touch a grain of it, you know, it's going to seep through your skin and kill you instantly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Those kind of things. Pretty much debunked. Yeah. Yeah. But that's still out there, unfortunately. So, yeah. And again, like all these, these things we need to be doing come under the heading of stigma, because if we could, again, treat these folks as people with a, a medical issue rather than simply criminals, um, you know, we sort of look, deal with these issues better yeah so do you think that we as a nation can eventually overcome the opioid epidemic i hope so i think we have a long way to go though Mm -hmm. um i I think COVID sort of underscores that how woefully inept and bureaucratically byzantine our systems were you know we samsa relax the guidelines for medication assisted treatment and now they do buprenorphine initiations on telehealth which Mm -hmm. is great but we only loosened that 
when it became dangerous for the providers, yeah. right? <laughs> right. And you see now, like, the world doesn't end. People aren't, I mean, I'm sure some, a few people probably are selling it on the street, but most people are using it responsibly and uh, getting kids back and jobs back. And we let our policies be dictated by a few bad apples rather than the science too often, I think. So I don't know. I asked, I was interviewing some economists a couple months ago, right at the start of this. I said, what do you think? Is this going to happen? This is the the couple that coined the term deaths of despair. Mm-hmm. And they said 50, 50 COVID's either going to really blow us up or <laughs> people are going to finally get motivated to elect people who are, who are going to really address these issues. And I, of course I, I and you and everybody hopes it's the latter. So, yes, to say the least. Yeah. Hey, besides... Be Debbie Downer, I try to stay optimistic, but sometimes it's hard. Well, it's reality. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's what we're faced with. So yeah. you can't sugarcoat it. Yeah. Hey, um, besides reading Dope Sick, is there another book or a resource related to this topic that you might recommend to our listeners? Sure. Uh, there's a terrific book by a bioethicist at Johns Hopkins named Travis Reeder, spelled R-I-E-D-E-R. And the book is called In Pain, and it's his journey after being injured in a motorcycle wreck um, and becoming quickly dependent on mm-hmm. opioids and seeing how ill-prepared the medical establishment was, was to deal with him. And this is somebody with a great job. Johns Hopkins faculty, you know, loving family, a lot of support, and just just narrowly missed uh, falling into addiction. Um, and he really parses out with a lot of nuance the issue that, um, you know, if somebody has been using chronic pain meds for a long time, it's not cool to just like jerk them off their meds because now suddenly. 20 years later, we realize we're into an opioid crisis that, that that a lot of care has to be taken with that and that we don't talk enough about that in med schools. And that's starting to change. So I would recommend that book. It was really terrific. Um, a novel I read that's set against the backdrop of the opioid crisis is by a Philadelphia novelist named Liz Moore, and it's called Bright Long River. It might be called Long Bright River, but it's called one of those. Okay. And it's by Liz Moore, and it's about these two sisters. One is a police officer, and the other is an opioid-addicted person who is kind of living on the streets. And um, uh, it's sort of about their interface between as both sisters, and there's a killer loose who's killing uh, opioid-addicted women. Um, so that was super interesting and it was just a great, great read. Uh, you know, the books I relied upon a lot in my research were Painkiller by Barry Meyer, of course, Dreamland by Sam Canonies. Um, there's a great book out called American Overdose by Chris McGreal. Um, there's a book solely on fentanyl, uh, called Fentanyl Inc. Um, I really like when I'm in the tube, as my husband calls it, and I'm really on deadline. I like to read novels for pleasure mm-hmm. and stay in my nonfiction reading, which feels like work to me <laughs> uh, for during the day. When I'm, but I love to read novels. That's why the, the Liz Moore book was great, and I just went back and read one of her earlier books called Heft, which was totally different, and um, but fantastic. Well, thank you for those recommendations. Yeah. And uh, for our listeners, I'll include links to those in our uh, show notes today. Oh, great. Yeah. Hey, um, we're about out of time, but I wanted to see if maybe you had any parting words of wisdom for our audience. Yeah. I mean, I think reading and educating, I think, you know, we really need to educate ourselves about this. So so reading um, about substance use disorder and mental health care, um, uh, I've said in numerous speeches that I think we need a Marshall type plan for mental health and substance use disorders. We need more jail based in tr- treatment like Rhode Island has. Um, and, and I'm super behind uh, the Black Lives Matter campaign to end mass incarceration in, in the war on drugs and think that we should look at what Portugal has done, which is mm-hmm. to decriminalize drugs and then put some of that money toward treatment and social services. 
and now has the lowest rate of drug reuse in in Europe. You know, we know from research that blacks use drugs at a lesser rate than whites, but are still five times more likely to be jailed for it. Um, and I think we need more efforts um, around harm reduction. So syringe exchanges, um, mm -hmm. you know, I know we have a mobile unit getting going here in Roanoke. We need more transitional housing support. Um, and one of my favorite things that's come out of my reporting has been a shift in at Carillion where they're now doing buprenorphine uh, initiation in the ER. Right. And when, you know, I first interviewed the head of the ED, Dr. John Burton, he said, we didn't think, he, they didn't think it was within their purview to take that on. You have to have a special waiver, which is another thing I think should, that should be let go of, but it isn't. So he got all his dots wavered, and now they're sending people to treatment instead of just treating whatever their acute thing is and then sending them back out on the streets to use again. And they're having terrific results. And when you ask him, how do you feel about that? He says, fantastic. I feel like mental cartwheels every day. And so he becomes a believer. And then he tells other ED folks about uh you know, he helps spread the gospel of that. Mm -hmm. And and that's really exciting to me. Um, and that's part of educating ourselves. So I always sort of like to say to audiences that I'm speaking to, if you know drug court judges, if you know probation officers, if you know police officials, community officials, uh, tell them about these programs. Um, and there's a lot of great models out there including Dr. John Burton at the, at the ED at Carillion that are really doing forward thing, forward thinking things and um, are really, really making a difference. It's just, do we have the will as a nation, as a community, most of this stuff happens when one person gets really passionate about it and makes it happen, works their butt off against many, many cultural barriers to do it. And, but once they do it, they're just like on top of the world, they're converted, you know? And mm -hmm. so that's really cool. And I, I, I have a piece in the Atlantic last month or no, it was in May about a treatment provider in uh, rural Indiana who had figured out how to make the courts and the healthcare systems mesh. And so that's where people so often fall through right. the cracks. And so there are models out there, but I just think we need to, so I always say, if you know the gatekeepers, talk to them about these people who are doing really innovative things, because this could happen to any one of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Beth, you've been very generous with your time, and I've oh, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah. And appreciate your interest and the great questions, and appreciate all you do. Would love to have you back sometime. Will do. Thanks, Sounds Mark. great. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Dissect and Connect is sponsored by Teen Connections, a leadership program through Planned Parenthood South Atlantic that empowers youth with the facts about sexual health and the skills to build stronger, healthier relationships. It's free, totally virtual, and you can earn $100 when you graduate as a Teen Connections peer educator in your community. Join a Teen Connections program from home today. For more information, be sure to check out the show notes from today's episode. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Dissect and Connect podcast. To learn more about Montgomery County Prevention Partners, our New River Valley Community Services, be sure to check us out on Facebook or visit nrvcs.org podcast.